and my students eventually got really sick of me comparing everything to a tree because that was the only thing I could see out of my window. <laughs> but when I was writing, I was sitting and I looked out the window and I saw something really interesting. I don't think I'd ever really seen it before, but I saw a squirrel on a tree. <laughs> I saw a squirrel chasing a lizard. And I was like, I don't know if I've ever seen a squirrel chase a lizard. And I was like, maybe it's all in good fun. So I watched this squirrel for a minute and this lizard, they're kind of similar when you watch them the way they operate in a tree. They both know trees like nobody's business and I'm not gonna do a tree metaphor, I promise. The squirrel chases this lizard and the lizard got to the backside of the tree and they're both kind of running around and couldn't figure it out. And then I realized quickly that I could not do anything with this metaphor. So, <laughs> but one thing that's really about this man that we follow named Jesus is that he was always looking out either a window or out into nature to make metaphors. Jesus was always using metaphors like vine and branches. Jesus was always using metaphors like shepherd and sheep. Jesus was always looking out at what was close and what was familiar and making it known, right? Jesus wasn't trying to trying to make us understand the position or the ways of a king because we tried to do the king thing as, as Jesus and God people. We did the king thing and that fell apart. We did the judge thing and that fell apart. We did, we did the, uh, the prophet thing and we murdered all of them. So, <laughs> so Jesus is always trying to find, well, what's the thing that I could make them understand the relationship between an overseer, the person who is in charge, and the people themselves because we did the king thing and it didn't work because that isn't... God works, that's the way the world works. So he looks out and he sees what? He sees something familiar. This is a very agrarian culture. This is a people who till the land, work the land, work the fields, live with the animals almost side by side. Jesus, in the, in the own lore we have of Jesus' birth himself, he was born next to animals. This is not how we grew up where we're like, well, we have a dog and he has really good tricks. He's a part of the family. It's like, no, there's animals everywhere all the time. And then there's also the people who tend to those animals. So Jesus uses the metaphor of a shepherd and sheep. And I'm sure he was like, uh, um, how do I explain this to them? Uh, a good shepherd comes in through the gate. Do, do they understand? How do I make them understand? A bad, a thief would climb the fence. And so Jesus goes into this really long thing. Did you know this? The reason we use the word pastor in the first place is because it's the Latin for shepherd. A pastor is not just like this high and mighty position of grandeur, but it's someone that's close to the sheep. And Jesus gives us this real long thing about the difference between the person who comes in the gate and the person who climbs it. And then what does a person who would climb it do? And what, was, what would a person who comes in the right way, how would they act? What would their demeanor be like? And I think it's really cool because from John 10, 1 through 2, he starts off with the how do you get in in the first place? There's a right and wrong way to get into the sheepfold. And in, the, in today's day and age, we watch a lot, I've seen a lot of pastors, we see it on TV all the time, leaders, people who get put in these places of authority and power. They're people who climb the fence. They don't always come in through the right channels. We've seen a lot of pastors fall in the, just the past four years because they were thieves. One thing that I think is so cool about Sean, and I'm not gonna make this just all about Sean, this is gonna be about us. But it does speak to us because Sean came in through the gate. There was no corner cutting. And that's not just because Sean's that type of person, but because we have a, a system set up in such a way as a flock that we make sure that that's how people come in. No grifters, no thieves, no murderers. No one that's going to come in and hurt the flock. So the first thing that's important is how they come in in the first place. And then Jesus kind of goes into this whole thing about how a shepherd leads. 
And we're so ready to make, oh, the leader is a king and someone who makes all the decisions and tells the people what to do is the answer man. Bible answer man is our pastor. He knows everything. Absolutely not. Jesus is saying this. He's like, it's not an above position. He even says, he says that the shepherd walks ahead and the sheep know the shepherd's voice. So you don't just lead by the things that you say because a lot of people say a lot of things that get us really excited, but it also comes down to the way that they lead, the way that they walk ahead, not the way that they lord over you, but the way that they set an example before you. In this system, the way that Jesus is trying to set it up, I think I can almost hear a frustration in his voice because he starts telling this, and then it says halfway through, it goes back from red to white and says what? It says they were like, huh? (laughs) Which was typically the way. Because they understood the dynamic of shepherd and sheep, but Jesus was trying to put it in context of how we ought to live around one another, and that goes, "Eh, eh, eh." that makes no sense to us. We want a powerful leader that tells us what to do. And Jesus is like, no, you need a shepherd who walks ahead of you, speaks someone that you know their voice and know what they mean, that they cause you no harm, they mean you no harm. Someone who's not lording over you, but walking ahead of you. Jesus then goes into the difference between a shepherd and a thief. And this is not just a guide rail or a guideline for the shepherd himself, but for the sheep to understand what to look out for. How do we know? It's easy to get a smooth talking pastor. (laughs) Have you ever been in a church with a smooth talking pastor? I, I have silver tongue silver tongue and could talk in enough circles till you say amen because you're so confused. (laughs) But then he goes in to, to helping you understand not just the order of, of pastorship or shepherd for the sake of the shepherd, but for the sake of those being shepherded, for the sheep themselves. He goes through and he says, listen, the shepherd gives freedom and the thief dominates. The shepherd wants to give you a full life and the thief wants to cut it short of fullness. The shepherd sacrifices himself and the thief leaves the sheep vulnerable. I've been in those churches. I grew up in church my whole life. A lot of you know, and I've seen a lot of pastors come and go. And I've been close to almost zero of them. Maybe maybe one youth pastor I had that I was actually close to. Not someone who was ready to stand and fight with me and be with me and listen to my crazy questions and listen to me ramble and just be there for me, but someone who usually would leave us vulnerable. Kind of just out there wondering if you're getting any of it right. (laughs) And in the tradition, I grew up wondering if tomorrow, if you got in a car accident and said the S word, you went to hell. (laughs) (laughs) A shepherd is here to give and a thief is here get. This is a good road map for both the shepherd and the sheep because it's not a top-down thing and it's barely even this. It's more this. We're responsible for one another. We're responsible for the integrity of our shepherd just as much as the shepherd is responsible for tending to the sheep. Some of you know I, I did pastor for a few years. And one thing that you might not know, I'm going to spill the tea here a little bit. Behind closed doors, I heard a lot of pastors use this language, and it used to irk me because I was like, yo, you realize I used to sit in the pews? <laughs> we call the people the sheep because sheep are stupid. I don't really understand that. I think at first I was probably like, oh, that's good. They need a leader. They need someone like me who's got it figured out. Sheep need a shepherd because sheep are stupid. Which can be true. But as I was going through this, I was like, is that, is that really why Jesus chose sheep? That seems like Jesus is kind of a jerk. Like he's talking down to the very people he's talking to, right? He's like, listen, guys, you need a shepherd, dummies. That's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus chooses sheep 
because he knows one thing that's very important about them by themselves, they are vulnerable. But sheep, we've actually learned more recently. I, I wonder if scientists started looking into it because they heard enough Christian pastors say that sheep are stupid. They're like, we got to find out if that's true. Are they making this up? <laughs> are they making this up? What's going on? Sheep, when they feel threatened or vulnerable, get in real bad trouble when they're on their own. But what sheep have learned to do is band together. When they're in trouble, they draw closer to one another. They do not run from one another because they become prey. It is all together, all the time. Because sometimes the shepherd's not always there with his crook to caca. Or what did, what, did, uh, what did David have, a sling? So the sheep band together. And when the sheep band together, they'll start to understand. Jesus is telling a real deep truth here that we could probably pick at it for the next hour, and we will. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that the sheep need a shepherd because someone needs to teach them to band together. And when they do band together, they will know whether they have a shepherd or a thief among them. And they will know when to come together. And they will know when to not run away, when to not walk away, when to not throw their hands up in the air. Because then they walk off. In, their, in the own story that Jesus was telling, he's talking about when they walk away, that's when the wolf attacks. Sheep aren't stupid. Jesus is using a really good metaphor, right, about sheep and shepherds, which all of us know since we've all raised sheep at some point in our lives. We're really distant from that metaphor. How many of you were raised on more than an acre of land? That's awesome. How many of you under the age of 40 were on? <laughs> How many of you grew up adjacent to or a part of a farm or any type of pasture animals? Yeah, not a lot of us. So this metaphor is a little bit away from us, right? So we read it and we're like, well, Jesus is trying to tell us something really important about sheep. And that's probably true, but we don't totally get the whole thing because go ahead and look at your hands. If you have hooves, go ahead and raise one. You don't have hooves. You don't have wool. Hopefully you have four fingers and an opposable thumb. We're not sheep. We're not actually sheep, but Jesus is using the best metaphor. And guess what? Just because, and because we're not sheep, we also don't have a shepherd. So we are a little bit lost on this metaphor but Jesus is trying to teach us about a way to band together. Not just to protect ourselves, not for self-preservation, but he's trying to tell us that there is a way to go about this. There is a way for the someone that you want to lead to get in. There is a way that they lead, and then there is a way that you keep both them and yourselves accountable. You are not actually sheep. There is in fact a lot of responsibility in this text for the shepherd themselves. And I don't think Jesus is kidding when he uses these metaphors. I think he really wants us to dig deep. But it puts a lot of onus. If we read it wrong, it puts a lot of the responsibility solely on the shepherd and it lets us kick our shoes off, lean back and go, do all the right things, pastor. Make us happy, pastor. Don't come up against me about the color of the walls in the sanctuary, pastor. And that's not how this goes. But I will say this. 1 Timothy 1, or excuse me, 3, 1 through 13, Paul goes into a, a little bit of a tirade about, listen, he says, there is a good saying about how overseers ought to act. And it really, I think if you've ever been a pastor, if you've been in any type of leadership role, any type of position where people are under you, it can be nerve wracking. To feel like, well, what if I make a mistake? Or what if I do something wrong? What if, what if I trip? What if I stumble? What if I fall? Paul says this when he writes to Timothy. He said, here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach. I'm already like, I'm out. That's, that's not me. <laughs> Faithful to his wife. Temperate. Self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. And the real good thing for us 
is that that responsibility that is put on an overseer is also given to us to make sure that we, in return, tend to the person who's overseeing us. Because what a lot of pastors do, and I've watched it happen, is that they don't live up to that, and so what they do is they hide. Because I can't let the people know I'm not perfect. They, I gotta keep up some type of veil of perfection that I'm doing everything right. And we become a group of people who then push our own, our own shepherd into such a place where they cannot be vulnerable, they cannot be honest, and they cannot be themselves. And when you can't be yourselves, you diminish the image of God. That vulnerability is so important. Those words from Jesus and those words from Paul can be an isolating reality very quickly. I don't know if you know this. I know a lot of you have been in churches and maybe you've seen pastors come and go and you've seen it done really well and you've seen it done really badly. Maybe you've been hurt yourself. Maybe you've been a part of hurt. But there are statistics out there that some of us don't know because we don't realize, like, oh, it just just happened in my church. Oh, it's an isolated incident. The role of a pastor, especially now, the statistics are through the roof. 75% of pastors report being highly or extremely stressed. 75%. That might as well just say 100%. Because I'm going to guess those are the only ones being honest. 70% constantly end up fighting depression. 40% have a serious conflict with a parishioner at least once a month. Usually due to the color of the walls. In the last statistic, 61 to 70% of pastors in America report having no close friends. No close friends. The shepherd's not supposed to be so far separated from the sheep that he has no friends, that she has no friends. No close friends. The last statistic I saw, which was interesting because it said 100% of pastors know at least one pastor who is no longer in service. And there's plenty of ministers in this room who would raise their hand probably make it 101%. And it's because we have the wrong vision of what we're looking for when we're looking for a pastor, when we're looking for a shepherd, when we're looking for the person who goes ahead. The onus isn't just on the pastor as leader to do everything correct every time, in every way, in every situation. If that person exists, they will probably get sucked up into heaven right away. (laughs) Did Sean leave? I'm just kidding. (laughs) Did you like that one? (laughs) But the no close friends things is insane, and I've watched it happen. And I will tell you this. I know this much about Sean that that's not true about him, and I'm so thankful for that because he and I are close friends. And if we're not there for one another, my charge is mostly to the church today because Sean has completed every step that he's needed to complete. He's gone through all of the right channels, and today we're going to celebrate and honor him. And then from there on out, it's on all of us, including him, to make sure that this goes good. To make sure we're there for one another. To make sure that when we hold hands at the end of service and say, let there be peace on earth, that we let it begin right now here with each of us. The song ends and let it begin with me and maybe it should say we. A few chapters later in John 15, Jesus is sitting with his disciples and he looks at them and he says this. He says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Even Jesus saw the importance of friendship. He's like, I've told you everything I could tell you. And he says this, he says, because a, he says, a master does not confide in servants, but in friends. 
I think I've read that a bunch of times because I love that Jesus calls us friends, but I always get past the part where Jesus was saying, I need to confide in you also. It's not just me, because if it's just me, you need to know I'm going to the cross to die, and if it's just me, this will end when I'm gone. It's a we thing. It always has been a we thing. We don't want a king. We don't want to judge. Jesus has told us with his own words and with his own action, with his own voice and stepping ahead of us that he wants us to follow a shepherd. And not just to follow, but to be a friend. Can I pray for us? Creator, we are thankful for your words and your example. And that though we call you Lord, you don't lord over us in the way of someone who's there to control, but as someone who walks beside us. We ask today as we celebrate the ordination of our pastor, God, that you are also ordaining us right under him. God, as a, as a good flock that has a good shepherd, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. this role. Um, the United Church of Christ of New Smyrna Beach, after careful, carefully considering the call to ordained ministry of Sean Proctor, respectfully request that the Florida Conference ordain Sean to the ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ, consistent with scripture and with the traditions of the church universal and according to the faith and order of the United Church of Christ. Now I have the lapel mic on. Can you hear me now? Nope. Oh, now? Yes? Yes? All right. So then Sean might need this. And in just a minute, we're going to call you up. And I'm not that tall. <laughs> All right. So now I am representing the Florida Conference Committee on Ministry. The Florida Conference has reviewed the request of the United Church of Christ of New Smyrna Beach we have prayerfully examined Sean concerning his fitness for ministry in Christ's church. We are pleased on behalf of the United Church of Christ to authorize the ordination of Sean into Christian ministry. Sean Proctor, servant of God, we invite you to come forward as a sign of your consent to receive ordination into the United Church of Christ acknowledges as its sole head Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior. It acknowledges as kindred in Christ all who share in this confession. It looks to the Word of God and the Scriptures and to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to prosper its creative and redemptive work in the world. It claims as its own the faith of the historic church expressed in the creeds and reclaimed in the basic rights of the Protestant reformers. It affirms the responsibility of the church in each generation to make this faith its own in reality of worship, in honesty of thought and expression, and in purity of heart before God. 
In accordance with the teaching of our Lord and the practice prevailing among Christians, it recognizes two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. The United Church of Christ recognizes that God calls the whole ministry of Jesus Christ by witnessing to the gospel in church and society. The United Church of Christ seeks to undergird the ministry of its members by nurturing faith, calling forth gifts, and equipping members for Christian service. All right, one more. <laughs> no, it's not it, no wonder you couldn't hear me. <laughs> I'll let you come center. I'll say this in a minute. I'm Leslie Etheridge, I'm the Associate Conference Minister. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I want to say that I had the privilege of staffing the search um, in which the search committee, where did Brandon go? He went to get a sip, oh, okay. Perfect sermon, which leads me into, um, the search committee from the beginning said, we want to call Sean. We're like, no, 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 got to go through this process, got to go through every step of this process. And um, about midway through, we want to call Sean. Got to go through this process, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, you know, they asked several people, they, okay, maybe this is the one, maybe this one. Toward the end of the process, we want to call Sean. <laughs> okay, you've done it. Sean walked through the gate the right way. Yes, so, yes, <laughs> that was perfect. That was perfect. <laughs> and he insisted on it being that way as well. So I will tell you from that that ordination is the right whereby the United Church of Christ through an association or conference, conference in our case, in cooperation with the person and a local church of the United Church of Christ, you being that, recognizes and authorizes that member whom God has called to ordained ministry and sets that person apart by prayer and the laying on of hands. By this right, ordained ministerial standing is conferred and authorization given to perform the duties and exercise the prerogatives of ordained ministry in the United Church of Christ. Now I'll tell you that about the next page of this is old traditional language, but it is beautiful. If you can stick with it, stick with me for just a minute here and, and listen, especially since you can hold him accountable later on. Well, you said, you know, um, uh, it, it is beautiful language. Forgive a mammal. Mm -hmm. Hear these words from Jesus Christ to the first disciples. Follow me and I will make you fishers of humanity. Hear also these words of Jesus. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them and their great leaders exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. You must be the servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Sean Proctor, before God and the congregation, we ask you, are you persuaded that God has called you to be an ordained minister of the Church of Jesus Christ? And are you ready with the help of God to enter the ministry and to serve faithfully in it? I am. Do you, with the church throughout the world, hear the word of God in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? And do you accept the word of God as the rule of Christian faith and practice? I do. Do you promise to be diligent in your private prayers? You're going to need those. And, <laughs> and in reading the scriptures as well as in the public duties of your office? I do, relying on God's grace. Will you be zealous in maintaining both the truth of the gospel and the peace of the church, speaking the truth in love? I will, relying on God's grace. Will you be faithful in preaching and teaching the gospel 
in administering the sacraments and rites of the church and, insert, and in exercising pastoral care and leadership. I will, relying on God's grace. Will you keep silent all confidences shared with you? I will, relying on God's grace. Will you seek to regard all people with equal love and concern and undertake to minister impartially to the needs of all? I will, relying on God's grace. Do you accept the faith and order of the United Church of Christ and will you as an ordained minister in this communion ecumenically reach out toward all who are in Christ and show Christian love to people of other faiths and people of no faith? I do and I will, relying on God's grace. People of God, you have heard the promises that Sean has made. What is your will? By the grace of God, he is worthy. Let us ordain him. Come, Holy Spirit. Will you support Sean in the ministry of Christ? We will. We ask now that all clergy would come for the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands is the symbolic act whereby the church in every age recognizes God's call to ministry in the lives of faithful women and men and asks the Holy Spirit to confer on them gifts for ordained ministry. Let us pray. Eternal God, in wisdom you govern all things. And from the beginning, you have chosen faithful people to serve you in ministry, calling some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip all your people for the work of the ministry and for building up the body of Christ. Now bless and sanctify by you, Holy Spirit, your servant, Sean, whom we in your name and in obedience to your will by prayer and with laying on of hands ordain into the ministry of the church, committing to him the authority to preach your word, administer the sacraments, and exercise the responsibilities of pastor and teacher. Bestow on Sean the power of the Holy Spirit, confirming what we do, let the same mind being, be in him that was also in Christ Jesus. Enable him to nourish your people in the faith of the gospel. Fill his speech with truth and his life with purity. Increase the faith of Sean in you. Strengthen him in the day of trouble. Prosper his words and works that, you na that your name may be glorified and your truth exalted through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and savior. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Sean, you may rise. <laughs> Stay right there. I need to get what's over here. Mariah, where's Mariah? Because ministry is not done in a vacuum. <laughs> they know who the real boss is. It's all right. Okay, <laughs> got that taken care of right off the bat. Yeah. Very good. In the name of Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and by the authority of the Florida Conference of the United Church of Christ, I declare you to be ordained into the ministry of Jesus Christ. Congratulations. Congratulations.
congratulations to you too. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a box. And we have a local church representative doing something at this point. Very good, thank you. Uh, let me see if one of these will work. My name is Belinda McCarthy. I'm the vice moderator. And I am very fortunate to begin the gift giving process. Our first gift from your church. Receive at our hands this Bible, of which you are appointed as interpreter. I have to say, Sean has been leading Bible study for the last year and a half, ever since I've known him, and that's how I actually got to know him. It's been the most wonderful experience in Christianity of my life. We know you will be diligent in the study of its message so that you may speak with the authority of truth and be a faithful minister of the word and the sacrament. Wow, that was cool. I have no tears here. I just have a lot of joy. Uh, Sean, a couple of, there's a couple of gifts here. First of all, you know, everything is a prayer, Sean. Every moment is a prayer, every breath is a prayer, every idea is a prayer. I have a lot of prayers. But this cool little thing around here came up within the last week while you were away, and Actually, yeah, vacation at the right time. you did, you did. But there are little messages on the tissue paper of love from your congregation, and um, they are just kind of hidden there, and they will surround you during your ministry. It's a really cool thing. Um, that's just one little thing. The other thing is, you know, I mean, I do a little bit of sewing, and um, this is really a custom-made alb for um, Sean. It's Irish linen. I had the fabric for another project that didn't get done, but this one got done. And it is lovely and um, happy on behalf of our beautiful congregation to present that to you. In addition to the stole, he, he, Sean said uh, maybe three weeks ago, Debbie, do you, do you think there will be a stole involved? I said, no, no way. I was in the middle of making this, and I just thought, no. But I happened to work at the thrift store, and this is totally a thrift stole. Um, the linen department did have a lot of green linens, and um, honestly, so that's, that's where it started, sort of began. I am a big thrifter, I'm a big reuser, so um, that's a wonderful thing. And I just want to tell you, one of the things that I love, um, the great commandment, love one another, I always, I always say if we got that right, we'd be golden. But um, one love, I love this, one love, because it's, it's sort of on love, and, and the E is like energy. There's a lot of meanings behind it. I hope you wear it in just a lot of love for many years to come, wherever you are. And um, the shepherd's crook, I loved this. I have this at home. It's so crooked and bent, just like we are. And he said yes, yes, yes to us. I think it's really cool. So um, that's just some. Now, I think, um, let's see. Do we, do we call Sammy up? Don't, don't forget, we have one more after Sammy, so you do that. Well, you have to go. There's no choice. There's no choice. I'm just here to say, hey, I'm Sammy. I figure everybody knows me. Love you. They do know. Um, you need your own communion set, so don't get confused with the picture that looks like a mug. <laughs> with a little spout don't get excited okay so you need every pastor needs his own i don't know if you have one i don't think I don't. you do I don't. so this is your own to serve to us thank you in ordinary time look at that greed and then you know i'll paint it i just threw it on the potter's wheel this morning Did you? I, you, know, you know how <laughs> And it was clay I got at the thrift store. 
we're a thrifty church. But I know I can say from all of us, we do love you. We made the right choice. Okay, and speaking of the thrift store, which we love here, because it really keeps our bottom line afloat, Jim and Henry were in the thrift store um, maybe a month or so ago, and they, they let me in on this little secret. And um, it's a little secret that they were planning something for Sean's ordination. And um, they worked really hard. Um, Henry worked you, impeccably hard on this project. Henry is a gifted artist, and they did this um, collectively and, um, and wanted to present it to you today. It is done with crystals, bit by bit. It is spectacular. Thirty thousand crystals. Come on, Henry, stand up, Henry. Take a bow. And Sean, move over. We can't oh, see it. Um, can see it. Yes, scoot over to the <laughs> Oh my gosh. I will say, search committee, it's a good thing you didn't let me in on your, on your plans in the beginning of wanting to call me because I would have said no. <laughs> There's good reason for that. And a lot of it has to do with what we talked about this morning for those of you that were here about Sarah laughing at God, right? Well, I had to do a little bit of my la own laughing at God. And I had to do a little bit of uh, what we said this morning about having an imagination. We have to have imagination and understand that we're not always going to be in the same place that we are now. Things change because God's plan means progress. And we call ourselves a progressive church because we do progress. We're progressing towards the kingdom of God. And each of us have that little piece in that little play. And sometimes we kind of laugh when we figure out what our role is. It took me a minute to be able to say yes, yes, yes to that. And, uh, but I've never been happier than I have. I've never felt more at home, uh, never felt more just at peace. I've never been a year into a job and not been burnt out. How about that? Maybe I'm in that 25%, Brandon. Maybe I'm in that 25%. I don't know. Um, oh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, that's it. But really, I want to thank all of you. And I also want to, I think even though the order's different in the bulletin, I'm going to go ahead and do the benediction now so that we can go out on music. And uh, I really want to thank the band for being here. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I love bluegrass. I wanted it to be a little bit different. So let's go out now. Gracious God, we're going to go out there into the world and, and go into our own calling. May we have the imagination to be good sheep.
May we learn when to laugh and when not to laugh at your plans. May we have the imagination to move on the status quo, move beyond it, to progress into who you are calling us to be. And may we go out into the world and be good sheep. Everybody say, bah. <laughs> May we all be here until we come back next week, but may we go out into the world and take Jesus Christ's love and that plan with much laughter. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. 
as we leave, I'd like to remind you that we have, are, of course, having some bluegrass and barbecue out. And by the way, if you weren't here this morning, I wrote a haiku about pork. And you missed it, so sorry. Um, but you missed it. Oh, I don't remember it. Jeez, I erased that program. Um, but uh, please join us out there. But what we're going to ask is that people leave through the narthex, and then the food is in Community Hall. So if you please go into Community Hall and get it. And what was the rest of that, Dave? Did I get it right? Oh, yes. We're going to ask people when you, to go out to the yard because it's just messy back there with lots of roots and stuff, come around the front of the church, through the, through the breezeway and around to the front of the church to come back to the back. Okay? Thank you, everybody. All clergy, please remain for a moment that participated in the laying on of hands. We're just going to get a picture of you up front. Thank you, everybody, for being here.